school thing. And so let's give a warm welcome to Claire. Thank you. Thank you. So yes, I am Michael's wife and um, I am a rapid transformational therapist. And if you don't know what that means, that's okay. But I work with um, beliefs and limiting beliefs and creating our <laughs> outer reality. <laughs> What's that about? <laughs> Sounds like that hit a nerve. <laughs> Yeah, oh, okay. And um, I have a disclaimer on my website. My lawyer makes me put up there because I'm not a doctor. I'm not licensed. I'm not a licensed therapist. I'm a coach. But this is the one I really wish I could put up there. Is if you hang out with me for too long, I'll brainwash you into believing in yourself and thinking you can achieve anything. <laughs> because as babies, we were born super confident. We're unsure of ourselves. We were completely naked. And look at me, look at me. But then over the years, we adopted and formed beliefs about ourselves that affected how we felt about ourselves, how we present ourselves to the world. And um, so a lot of what I do is just helping people uncover what those things are and then upgrading them and changing them. Um, so the five key strategies, and they're not going to be what you think, like stress less, do yoga, meditate, things like that. There's kind of... Um, a cluster of things I, I work with my clients on to really kind of create a life that they love and, and break through these beliefs. But the first one is fix the root cause of the issue. When someone calls me and they say, I want help with weight loss or I want help with this or that, um, I already know we're not going to be talking anything about that issue at all. It has nothing to do with that ever. Um, the weight loss, someone comes for weight loss, but it's really about self-love, self-value or grief. I had a client that was holding grief um, over his father's passing for 11 years, and then he lost nine pounds after he released that grief, wow. um, after he'd been trying. And so you know you're up against a subconscious belief um, when you're doing all the right things. You're doing all the things. You're doing everything you should be doing to like get to where you want to be. And as realtors in success, like I want to, I want to be here, and I'm doing all the things, I'm doing the work, but I, it's almost like there's an invisible wall in front of you, and you just kind of can't break past it. Um, whenever that's happening, you are working with a subconscious belief, and if we were aware of it on a conscious level, we would have already fixed it by now. We're all intelligent people, and we would have already fixed it. But it's a subconscious um, <clears throat> belief that runs in the background until we replace it and there's rules of the mind and one of the rules of the mind is you have a belief and that belief will run and be true for you until you replace it with another belief mm -hmm. so you have to uncover it and decide something different in order um, in order to actually be free of it <clears throat> so you can't intellectualize your way through that you can't well, I, I, I can do anything. I can do it. You know, it's not about false positivity or talking yourself into it. You really have to, like, I found the most success when you uncover what's really going on in the background and take it out for good. So the, the work I do is with beliefs, and a lot of the things we do in our lives to improve our lives or to be more successful is around actions, habits, and behaviors. So people go, well, if I do this, then <clears throat> I'll be more successful. Or if I do that, I'll be healthier, right? I see this a lot around diet. I'm going to exercise and eat right, and then everything in the world is going to be wonderful. Um, <clears throat> but the problem with that is that they're, they're running against all these other things that affect this. And so this is what, this, when you do this, it's effort efforting it's hard <laughs> it's like hard but if and a lot of like if you go to therapy they work with thoughts and emotions a lot like let's feel better but really our beliefs are what's running the show so our beliefs affect our thoughts what we think about ourselves and the world around us what we believe to be true and um so that's like the things we tell ourselves and then that affects our feeling state our emotions, how we feel, if we feel crummy or happy or good, or and <clears throat> our feelings affect our behaviors, our actions and habits. But most of the time we try to do all the things here. 
But actually, I discovered for myself first when I discovered this work, when you change the belief, everything else becomes easy. You no longer have to effort to reach what you're trying to do because you simply don't believe that thought that you were holding before. And so it becomes easy. An easy example of this um, of, from my own life is um, we had a baby during COVID. I gained 60 pounds because I ate a lot and sat around a lot and I was 42 and it was hard. And as I was losing weight, I realized I'm going to have to give up my nightly glass of wine. I'm going to have to do it. It's not in, it's not in um, alignment with what I'm doing. It's you know, sabotaging the whole effort. And so I stopped drinking wine. It was harder than I thought it was because it had become a habit and all this stuff. And so I was kind of efforting through that nighttime. We have four kids when the house is a train station and everything's happening. And um, so then I, I was like, okay, I do this. All right, what do I believe? I believe I need a glass of wine in order to relax. That's my belief. I need a glass of wine in order to relax. And I did my own process, my own work, until I no longer believed that, and then it wasn't hard. So that's, that's just an example of efforting versus not efforting. And how we form beliefs, if you've, if you've accepted an idea from yourself, your teachers, your parents, friends, advertisements from any other source, and you have been convinced that they are true, you have formed a belief. So this, most of our beliefs come from birth to eight years old, actually. Um, a lot of what I do, um, when I do, the, I do a, a conscious belief work and subconscious work, but when we do subconscious, a lot of times we re revisit situations when clients were zero to eight. That's a really um, telling time. And so if you think about it, we have all these beliefs about ourselves that we got from other people. Like maybe a teacher said, wow, you're just really not good at math. Mm -hmm. And then we, all of a sudden, we grow up and we're telling everybody, I'm not good at math, mm -hmm. you know? Or um, I'm, I can't talk to people, you know, because people said, you're shy, you're shy. I have one client now that she, um, she's been told her whole life, she's shy, you're so shy, you're so shy. And she's like, I'm not shy. And she, you know, she's starting to realize, I'm not shy, I just like to observe, you know? And I'm just, I don't have any problem talking to people. It's not like a fear of talking to people, I just like to observe people. And so there's tons of things like that. Um, and we are in advertisements and we're hypnotized all the time by advertisements <laughs> to believe something. An example of a way I work with beliefs is um, I had a belief I uncovered, and most people have one to three dominant beliefs that affect their lives and their reality and the way they experience the world. I discovered when I started my business, oh my gosh, I have a belief that I'm not good enough. And the way I discovered that was when I first started doing this, everybody thought what I was doing was super cool, but nobody wanted to pay me for it. <laughs> so I had a business coach and a coach that does my work and she said you know what the problem is and I was like I know and I don't like the answer she said you don't value yourself you don't they either you have an issue you don't think you should be paid for your work and I was like oh crap you know now now you're gonna make me do work and so I went through the process and um, some of what I do with the regression is um, I take people to the moment in time where they started to believe the belief that's creating the problem today. So it's root cause work. Instead of when I work with people with depression and anxiety, we don't talk about the depression, anxiety, the symptoms of that. That's, we're talking about what's causing you to have these symptoms. And so I went back. Um, in my mind, in my mind's eye, um, to a scene when I was five years old. I was in kindergarten, and I was coloring a puppy. And I was just coloring a puppy. I was happy with the world. I was coloring a puppy. We were all coloring puppies. But then we put our puppies up next to each other, 
and mine looked like this compared to everybody else's. Mm -hmm. And so in that moment, that five-year-old little girl went, oh, I thought I was good enough, but I guess I'm not. I actually revisited that inner kind of subconscious conversation. So I formed a belief, a conclusion, that I wasn't as good as other people. Um, we go back to one to four scenes. Another scene, I was um, <clears throat> in a choir, a youth choir, and, and I remembered this happening, too, but I didn't realize how uh, much it had affected me. And I sang a note really loud that was off-tune in this scene. I sang a note, and, I, and everybody kind of went, you know, like that, and the instructor like went like that. And in that moment, I was like, oh, I'm not, I, I suck. You know, I'm not good. <laughs> and then a scene when I was, I played the violin, and I was like third or fourth chair, and I practiced a lot. I practiced a lot. My mom and dad were both musicians. Um, and in that scene, I was looking at the first or second chair, and I really wanted to be there. But I decided no matter how hard I try, I'll never be there. That's what that little fourth grader decided. So. Which also led for you know led led to um, a belief that I have that so many people had that so many people have that if I try I'll fail, which is why they never start something. If I try I'll fail. So it doesn't matter how hard I work, I'll never get there. And so the process to dehypnotize yourself from this belief that's basically what it is because if we think about it, all these things we believe about the world and ourselves around us. Um, we just have to expose them, become aware of them, and then challenge them because most of our um, mind just goes unchecked, unchallenged, um, and it just runs in the background wreaking havoc on our life sometimes, and we're not aware that we're dealing with a belief. And so an easy thing to do is, what, what are the thoughts I'm having around this? What am I telling myself about this? What is the story I'm telling myself? What am I making this mean? And it usually, if you go, if you're really honest with yourself, you get to some sort of, I call it the ugly truth, some sort of ugly truth that you believe about yourself. Um, so it's just like dehypnotizing yourself. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna give an example using you, baby. <laughs> so um, my husband is a strong man. He's amazing. He owns a gym. He turns 50 next year and he has a goal of, I'm going to out your goal, I know, he's like, oh my gosh, of squatting 400 pounds. That's what he wants to do, 400 pounds. So he has um, that, he wants to do that. He developed, once he decided that, he developed some foot pain that was nagging him and, and we're walking one day and I couldn't help him, like, do you want to talk about it? You know, because you know, you know there's more going on here than you know her foot her, you want to talk about it and he goes yes <laughs> you know because he knows he'll feel better afterwards because we'll figure out what's really going on because the problem is never the problem even with physical pain our bodies are always sending us messages sometimes we know what those messages are sometimes we don't so we we went through the process and his body was protecting him and that's the thing your subconscious mind is always protecting you it's not trying to sabotage you we talk about self-sabotage is trying to protect you. It cares about your safety, not about your happiness. And so it will protect you from potential failure or um, having to report failure or um, pain of any sort, emotional pain. So it'll go to great lengths to protect you from pain. And so um, we went through the process and his foot was trying to hold him back from accomplishing his goal because um, he didn't really, I, correct me if I'm wrong, because it was a while ago, but you're, it was like you were afraid you weren't going to make your goal. And he was going to be publicly embarrassed and have to report failure. Because he's posting his journey on Instagram, he's you know, increasing his weights, but then he, the day he's 50, if he gets up there and um, can't squat the 400, so his body was protecting him from that embarrassment. Um, oh, I can't do it because of my foot. And so, um, so he's been working consciously with that. So it's just de understanding, finding the belief, dehypnotizing yourself. And 
Some beliefs that my clients have had are one woman, she was wanted to um, lose weight, and um, she was in her 60s. And she, we got to this belief that she formed that grandmothers are chubby. Good grandmothers are chubby. <laughs> so you can try to lose weight all you want, but your beliefs, your, your outer reality has to match your inner reality. That's the other, another rule of the mind. So if you truly believe good grandmothers are chubby, because she remembered her grandmother having a lot of <laughs> hugging her and having a lot of flesh to, then, um, then her mind and body are not going to be on board and let her lose the weight because she also desires to be a good grandmother. So we can untangle, replace, or remove false beliefs. And um, we do this by first becoming aware of them, then we challenge them, and then we replace them. And we do this consciously and subconsciously. And my daughter asked me once, like, what do you do, mom? Like, what do you do? <laughs> and so I, I do... I do hypnosis with clients. I have three certifications in hypnosis, but I've actually started doing hypnosis a lot less because um, I've discovered that people don't actually need to be in deep trances to access the information at all. It's just like a deep breath in one level below, and if, you, if they inquire within, the answers are there, they can access them. But in hypnosis and in certain circumstances, I do recommend that. Our thoughts and beliefs are like weeds, you can imagine. They're like weeds, and if you've ever weeded, you'd pull up the weed by the root, and it's very satisfying. But in conscious, in everyday consciousness, our brains are like cement, and we're kind of fixed in what we think and believe, and we don't really. But something really cool happens in hypnosis or in subconscious work. The connections, because if we pull up this weed, it's if you've ever weeded in the driveway, it's hard to get those <laughs> weeds out by the root. You can pull up the weed, but the root's still there. And so, but in hypnosis and in subconscious work and in meditation, in that, in different, those different brainwave states, our connections loosen and we kind of have an opportunity. We can pull out that belief and replace seeds. It was seeds that we want to believe, and so it will grow. And so one of the things I do is I make a personalized recording for people that they listen to every day for 21 days, supporting what they have decided for themselves that they're going to believe. And the good news is this is a skill, and it can be learned. So we can learn to do this consciously as well. And the way, the, the funny thing about um, this work too is a lot of people come to me and they want my help. Help me, help me feel better, help me lose weight, help me accomplish my goals, help me. But I don't want to change anything. I don't want to change anything in my life. I don't want to do anything. <laughs> Nothing needs to change. Um, Take this pill. Right. <laughs> Not how it works. <laughs> but so when we start in implementing the changes and doing new things, um, the way it goes is first we're unconsciously unskilled. We don't know what we don't know. So we don't know what to do, and we also don't even know that we're supposed to be doing anything differently. And then when we're consciously unskilled, we want to do things differently, but we don't have the skills. So that's the sweet spot of when, when I say, are you ready to clients? And they're like, yeah, I'm ready. Are you ready? <laughs> you know? like, it's when they know they want something different for themselves. Um, they just don't have the skills. And so you learn the skills, and then you're consciously skilled. That means that's where the effort is a little bit. You, okay, I'm, I want something different. I want to think something different. And it's just, I, and so I'm doing that. I'm thinking about it consciously. And then that turns into unconsciously skilled, which is just something you just do um, for yourself. You catch yourself. No, wait, I don't want to believe that. I'm going to believe this. And it's like a video game. So if you have a, a way you think, about something. There's a video game. You can play that and the buttons, I don't know, my 17 year old son, I swear, the, his <laughs> fingers just move. You know, it's, I don't even think he's thinking, you know, <laughs> it's like a zombie. Um, my ex husband jokes that they're going to find him in college, like dead at the PS5. <laughs> like, because it's crazy. But so that's, that's easy for him, right? But if I asked him to learn a new video game, he'd have to 
think about it. He'd have it would take a little bit more effort, and he, and what our thoughts and beliefs are like that. Well automatically go back to that comfortable thing but when we're trying and like oh no I forgot let me put that down now I'm going to do this so it is a skill and we can learn it so and this we're going to spend the most time on one fixing the problem the problem is never the problem so figuring out what is really going on um, and that is it's like detective work that's what I really love when people come to me and they they start talking about stuff I'm just like I wonder what's really going on so, and exploring underlying motivations. We can also ask ourselves, what is your mind avoiding? If you're avoiding something, you can say, what is my mind so afraid will happen? What is my mind so afraid will happen? And when I started to have some success in my business, it was really funny. I, I, I was like, oh my God, oh, it's too much. You know, it's too much. And um, I talked to one of my coaches, and my husband said, don't wish away what you've been wishing for. And I knew I was dealing with some sort of subconscious belief, and so my coach said, what are you afraid of? I said, I'm afraid that I'll be so busy I won't be able to handle the work, so I'm going to just push away the business. Good plan, right? <laughs> and um, so I brought that to awareness. Like, I was unaware of it, so I could have just let it run. But instead, I was like, what's going on? Oh, that's going on. Well, that's stupid. So um, I'll think something different. And getting to the ugly truth and replacing it with something better. So once you get to that root cause, it's, it's, it's almost like an ugly truth. It's something you don't love about yourself almost. Um, oh, gosh, I don't like that. And replacing it with something better. An example of this from one of my clients is I had a client that believed I'm crazy. Like, I'm crazy. Like, I don't think I can be fixed. I'm crazy. And as she started doing this work, she started realizing the truth. The truth is, I'm not crazy. In the past, I have not listened to my own inner voice. My mind and body fully support me and escalate that voice until I cannot ignore it. Then, the guilt, guilt, shoulds, and consequences of acting on my voice at that point create tension, anxiety, and confusion, and that is what I am feeling now. So telling yourself a different story I even tell my clients um, with depression, um, you, you've been triggered. Something's going on. What, some, you're upset about something. Maybe there's some sadness that needs to be processed. Something's happening. What's happening? Let's get really curious about that um, and allow yourself to feel it and move through it. But do we have to call that depression at 16 hours in? You know, And then we can get over that speed bump. Strategy number two is fix your money mindset. So, um, and this would be, as realtors, um, you guys deal with people's money beliefs, your clients' money beliefs, all the time. And so, they, they, everybody has a money set point, like a money mindset. And it comes from our conditioning, our upbringing. Think of how your parents talked about money, the conversations you overheard. There's never enough money. Um, uh, my parents, you know, talked about money all the time in that way. There's never enough, and money doesn't grow on trees. Um, that's for rich people, you know. So that's for people like that can do those kinds of things, but not me. And um, you also have a set point. Everybody has a set point, and you can think about it like a bottle of wine or a shirt. If you're comfortable, I'm comfortable buying a twelve to twenty dollar bottle of wine. That's my comfort zone. $50 bottle, could I afford that? Yes, but it's just like uncomfortable for me. That's not my set point. And same with a shirt. You could, or a dinner out, like a $200 dinner with your spouse. Comfortable, 400, 500, 600, where does it get uncomfortable? And then you can find your set point. Now your subconscious mind knows your set point and your inner reality has to match your outer reality. So if you start Maybe you start having more success or more income or more cash flow. Unless you grow your money mindset, you will start doing things to return to your set point, such as overspending to return to your set point or doing things like pushing the success away, pushing the clients away to come back to your set point so that's comfortable. So identifying your um, set point, and um, Michael and I did some work on this, um, on money set point and money um, beliefs around money. And the first thing you can do is just write down things that you believe about money. 
they, maybe you say them to each other, the kids, or money doesn't grow on trees, or um, you have to work hard for money, uh, things like that. And it will be true for you. But Michael and I did some work around money mindset, and um, he was my guinea pig at first, so we did some regression work. And we went back and, and healed some of his um, money mindset beliefs. And after we did that, his gym revenue started increasing by 50% a year. Oh. Yeah. Because what he believed was possible for him had to be true for him. So when he started believing something different, then different things happened. Um, and you will work with clients who have a fixed money mindset. And maybe they'll have different beliefs around money within their spouse, and that's super fun to, and you know, like it's just, it's fixed if they're not aware of it. Um, so you can identify your beliefs around money, write down what they are, decide if that's going to continue to be true for you, because they, they were true for your parents, most likely. Um, or, you know, maybe you went, to a friend's house when you were little and they had nice things, all the nice things, and in your little 10-year-old mind, you went, this is for other people are rich, but I'm not rich, we're not rich, that's, that's true for me. And so um, you can decide something different. If you're still not convinced, consider subconscious work because that's the thing about beliefs, you can't intellectually intellectualize your way and it's, and, and you know that when, if you've ever been in a position where you're like, I intellectually know this, it just does, I can't, it doesn't execute, right? I intellectually know this, but my mind and my body and my heart aren't on board. That's when you're up against some sort of subconscious belief that's still running in the background. Um, number three, become magnetic. So. This is about energy awareness and about being aware of the energy you're putting out to people, to your clients. Um, if, if you're not having success on the outer, in your outer reality, it's always something that you need to take a look at within you. If you've ever pulled back and kind of done some inner work and then all of a sudden you got busier, um, you understand what I'm saying. Um, so pay attention to the energy you're putting out there. Sometimes we think we do more, push more, contact more, go, 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 go. Um, sometimes that energy, there's a whole language, you know, being done and it's off-putting for some people. So they might start avoiding you or um, not calling you back and stuff like that. Has anybody ever experienced that? And um, so know when to pull back and know what to do to reset. Um, the, the energy language, what's happening. And it's usually come back and just what's going on. Okay, what's happening? What, what is my belief? What, it, what's, what am I telling myself right now? And I need to, I need to fix that. Does anybody have, I, I haven't asked you guys if anybody has any questions so far. So strategy number four is speak your truth. Um, identify other people's words that you have let in over time. And you can actually give them back their words. Um, and decide what is true for you as well as commit to truth telling. So a lot of people, um, if you can think of something about you that other people have said about you that you've taken on, like even like, let's, let's say you're so bad at math. A teacher told, let's say a teacher told you that. You're so bad at math. And like you weren't really going to be so bad at math. You just were in that moment. But now like I, I, I took that on. And now as an adult, I even say, oh, I'm so bad at math, right? So one of the things that we can do is we can actually visualize taking those, find those words in our bodies. You can tell I do a lot of somatic work. Take those words out and in your mind's eye, give them back to the person and say, here, you dropped something. <laughs> you know? Like, this may have been true for you, or this may be true for you, but I've decided it's not going to be true for me. So um, 
It can be anything. You know, you're rude or, but it's, that's not going to be true for me. You know, here's your words. You dropped it. I'm not going to hold, it's not going to take up space in my brain anymore. And that does, and, so, and some of these things that I'm doing, um, there's a method to the madness, you know, um, and it's about letting our minds know, it's, instead of our minds being in charge um, and running the show, just running wild, we're kind of taking charge of our mind and letting our minds know, this is what I'm going to be about. This is what we're doing now. This, you know, and um, <clears throat> because our mind does what it thinks it wants us to do, and it's like a bad spouse that <laughs> thinks it can read your mind, but it can't. So it's, it's always trying to protect you. So even like, um, uh, one of my mentors, she does a lot of speaking, and she used to um, be very afraid before she would start speaking. And she, she told a story once that she started telling her mind, I'm excited to do this. I love doing this. This is what I want to be doing. I love this. I love this. I love this. And it was almost like her mind was like, oh, I didn't know. You know, okay, well, we can stop being nervous. If this is something that you're excited to do, we'll get on board. Seems a little out there, but. So can I ask you? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so we read a book called uh, What to Say in the Talk to Someone. So, at some point, mm, beginning of this year, uh, and you just tell me if you don't want to talk about this in a group. But sure. at some point in the beginning of this year, uh, when I was reading, uh, what is the book, the, the Ninja Selling book? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. You're talking about um, setting your goals and mm -hmm. um, making it into a uh, um, affirmation. Mm -hmm. And um, so I said, okay, great. All right. So, did that, and of course, I'm, I'm a musician, so I put it on mm -hmm. audio, mm -hmm. and it was a little song, and I was listening to that thing every day, all day long, and, um, and you know, to, to like train my brain to believe, oh, this is the goal, mm -hmm. this is what I'm going to have, this is what I'm going to get, mm -hmm. what I'm going to do, blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah, and I feel like... I, not too long after that, the whole economy changed. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a question for you. I have a question for you. That affirmation that you wrote, you got to be honest here. Did you believe it? Yeah, I think so. You, you, be you believed it in your core. There wasn't any part of you that was like, no, you can't. No, you aren't. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think, I think uh, the whole point of doing the affirmation was to try to to try mm -hmm. to see that. Yeah, so affirmations are great, but that's why they don't work. <laughs> Unless you also support it with like subconscious mm -hmm. stuff because it's not about false positivity or talking yourself into it. That's like the whole, you can't intellectualize mm -hmm. yourself into it. Um, which is if you're gonna do an affirmation, it has to be absolutely true for you, accessible. So sometimes affirmations have to be stepwise. So if you want to make $100,000 a month, if your mind, body, and soul does not believe that that's possible for you, you can tell yourself all day long that you're going to make $100,000 a month, and you won't. Um, it has to be a little bit like the angels. Well... Are you capable of making $100,000? Yes, you are. But you believe you aren't. Well, what could you? No, it would be yes. But what could you believe? So if you can't jump to, I can make $100,000 a month, what could you believe? That's attainable. It, yeah. So I can't do $100,000 a month, but I know for sure I can do $30,000 a month. Okay. So... Then you tell yourself, mm -hmm. my ultimate goal is $100,000 a month. Mm -hmm. I know I can do $30,000 a month. And I, if I can do $30,000 a month, 
I would, I'd be working with like, if I can do $30,000 a month, I could probably reach 40, 35 or 40. Yes. And you step it up, okay? And then once you're at 40, now you have a new set point. Yes. And now you believe it. Oh, I did 48, okay. My ultimate goal, you're telling your mind, is $100,000 a month. I can make 40, I know I can make $40,000 a month. If I can make $40,000 a month, I'm gonna do this, this, and this to reach $50,000 a month. Mm -hmm. But I also know that from month to month, it goes down and up. So if I don't make $40,000 a month, I'm not going to make it mean that I'm a failure and I can't do it. What I'm gonna make it mean is that it's happening. It's just, it's like a, I, it's like a weight loss graph. <laughs> but ultimately you go down. Um, if you're going, if you got a high financial goal, it, it's gonna look like this. But as long as those down points, you don't, I'm failing, it's not working, the world's ending. You just tell yourself a different story. It's down this month, but a true story. It's down this month, but it's not, always going to be down because I've been through this long enough that I know that there's ups and downs. Mm -hmm. And um, so does that answer your question? Well, that's what happens with transactions and one falls out. You know, mm -hmm. But you had it. You were there to meet that 40,000. Mm -hmm. But one of them just said, okay, it, whatever, whatever reason was, mm -hmm. it didn't close. But you were on track to do it. Yeah, and just be really careful about the story you tell yourself, mm -hmm. what it means about you. Yeah. That that um, that got taken away and you didn't make the yeah. forty. Yeah, it's called failing forward. Mm -hmm. Like allow yourself. Don't beat yourself up yeah. um, for not making a goal. Like, well, that's one I learned how not to do it. You know, or I learned this better next time. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Because affirmations are great, as but you ha they you really have to believe it. There can't be any part of you. That's like, like I want to do that. No, you won't. I'm the, no, no, you aren't. No, you can't. There can't. That critic, inner critic in you will sabotage you unless you address the inner critic. Or the outside noise. Or the outside news. Yeah. Well, the, again, right? You're making, you're letting people's words in. People can tell you, you guys are selling houses right now, or you guys have sold houses in like down economies or bad housing markets. So, am I? What am I going to believe right now? Am I going to am I going to believe? Oh, the, the housing market, the, oh, hellfire and everything's happening, or this is a great opportunity. You know, you, you, and you're not lying to yourself. You're just deciding what you're going to what is going to be true for you. Yeah, Does that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that you would, if we had spoken in December, you would suggest that. Before you do that, let's talk about how you, like what you actually believe about these goals. Yeah. And figure out how to root up and out root and all that other stuff. Whatever the wrong beliefs are first. Get you to believe that it's possible. And then mm -hmm. having done that, then you say, okay, now go ahead and bump it in your car. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I I would just like pop the hood and make sure there wasn't anything underneath that is going that is that is um like not on board, right? That's gonna hold you back, <laughs> you know. And 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 you'll feel it. You'll feel it because you it will feel like there's a wall in front of you. Um, we did uh. I forgot what was what was the belief we did. Michael's my my favorite. I'm like, hey Michael, will you do this new exercise and let's see how it goes? What was the belief we worked on with the wall with you? Was that the financial stuff? Yeah, it was just success in business. Success in business. Yeah. So we did the imagery work, and the image he came up with was it was a wall. It was a brick wall, and it was a brick wall, and everything he wanted was on the other side, right? But it, he just couldn't get through, and. Um, when we applied the energy to the image, and, and that's why like, it's not coming from your thinking mind, you follow it. 
um, because your subconscious mind is giving you, like, this is what, how you need to think about it. Um, he got smaller and smaller and smaller, and there were cracks in the brick. And he went right through the crack. That's awesome. And he was on the other side. And that was, it's like an, in ways I don't even understand the imagery work, it works. Because he started increasing his revenue by 50% every year at the gym right after that exercise. That's so cool. So it removes blocks. Um, babe, I'm sorry. I'm going to, another way it did is, um, I when I, yeah, no, when, <laughs> more. when I started dating, when I started dating Michael, he had a, he has a beautiful daughter. She was nine years old, mm. beautiful, sweet, kind. Um, but I went over to his house and there were pictures everywhere of her. And I was like, I don't think you have room in your life for that woman. Um, and he was like, no, I do. And I was like, it, I just was feeling it. You know, I was like, I don't think you do. And they had this, um, special relationship and I just always felt like as we were dating I couldn't get in I felt like I was on the third wheel on the date like they were a couple and I was along for the ride that's how it felt even though we talked about it and he was like oh no yeah I'm with you know like I felt it and um one night we went to a Mexican restaurant the three of us and um and he's a wonderful man and uh but the server came and he ordered appetizers and drinks for him and Emma and the server walked away. And he looked at me and said, oh, did you want something? I went, yeah, 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 I did. And then so later on that night I said, I don't think I can do it. I don't think I can do it. I can't, I can't, like, I love you and I know you love me, but I can't, like, always feel this way if I'm in a relationship with you. I can't do it. And then I went, oh my gosh, let's do this work and see what happens. So the image that came to my mind was him and her in a bubble in the kitchen. And they were dancing together and cooking and baking and singing into their spatula microphones in this bubble. And I was on the outside of the bubble and I couldn't get through. And when I said notice things about the image, the, the bubble was made of this, like, it was almost like a, a smart bubble. Like it was a living substance almost. And I became aware that it existed and was formed to protect their relationship because he went through a nasty divorce, really nasty. And he had energetically created this happy bubble with him and Emma inside and the whole effing world was not invited in. <laughs> and other women had noticed this dynamic too. Um, so the bubble was there. So I applied the energy to the image Apply the energy to the image, and I didn't know what was going to happen, but the bubble popped. The bubble popped, and we're all standing there looking at each other, and it was like the first time we'd all stood there and looked at each other, like, now what? In my imagery, it was like, now what? And then we all started dancing together in this image. Cool, cool work, right? Well, a day or two went by, and Michael and I both started noticing things were different. I started feeling different. That, that, that it was no longer... The issue was just no longer there. It was just no longer there. And um, so that's the way this work works. Um, and, it's, oh and it's working with your subconscious mind. The, the, oh, no, I'm sorry, I'll speed up. The, the thing about Seek Your Truth, too, and the thing I talk to my clients a lot about, because a lot of people are people pleasers, and we worry a lot about what other people think about what we think. And we worry about a lot about what people think about what we say. <clears throat> We have to know that when we start speaking our truth or making decisions or um, that are in alignment with what's right for us, we are going to upset people. We are going to disappoint people or might even anger people. Sorry, I have tissues in my office, like lots of boxes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so because we're conditioned, like I think this, oh, don't think that, that makes me uncomfortable. And um, then think another way. Are you all right? No. Okay. Oh. And I don't mean to like make y'all cry. Oh, no. But it's good. No, it's, it's good. Okay. What yeah. You, what you were just saying. There's it's a lot okay. of holding that happens. We hold a lot. Yeah. And then when 
Of course. There's a little crack. Yeah, <laughs> it comes out. that's okay. Tears are okay. Tears are good. Yeah, well, um, one of my favorite quotes is, um, the tears, the emotions that can't find their expression in tears will cause other organs to weep. That's so true. Yeah. I forgot who said it, but it's an amazing quote. Uh, number five is create a life that you love. Tools are nice. These strategies are nice. These exercises I do with my clients are nice, but you need them less when you're living a life that you love, living a life that's in alignment with you and feeling completely empowered that you doing you is totally what you should be doing, no matter how it makes people feel, whether it opens you to ridicule and judgment, um, just creating a life that you love, understanding that people are gonna have opinions about it, not agree with it, think you're weird, talk about it, but you don't care because you're happy. <laughs> in, the, in, the, in your... That's, you get to that place. Yes. Yeah, it takes it takes bravery. It takes bravery and it takes conscious communication. And it's mostly like sometimes when we start living this way, our friendships change yeah. and our relationships with our family members change because they see you. If once you start changing, they see you in a fixed way and they're sometimes never going to see you any different than that way. And so when you do this work, it's a good change though. Things fall to the wayside that they'll no longer support you. And then you, what's left is this life that you do love. And you heal your fear of rejection or need for, uh, for approval to empower yourself to do things that are in alignment with what's right for you. After Michael and I had Alex, um, my whole family got together for Thanksgiving uh, in Upper Virginia. We had a little baby and I said, I'm not going. <laughs> I'm not driving in a car with an infant, listening to him cry, and I, and I can't nurse him in the car seat. It's not happening, and I'm not doing it. It's just, I, let's just stay here and, and hit the easy button. I got so much flack for that decision. My mom was like, well, Tyler went everywhere with his baby after they were born. Well, good for Tyler, you know. But And we're not driving, putting ourselves through that to listen to y'all argue at the table all day anyway. And so... <laughs> So my family thinks a lot of things about us because we do make decisions that are right for us. We're great. Um, so the first, the four steps to doing that is first becoming aware of your wants, needs, desires, opinions, and your view, how you want your life. Declare it, put it into action, and then uphold them. A lot of people don't even like really put a lot of thought into what they want. Oh, I'm sorry, could you go back to the previous slide real quick? Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we declare, we decide what's right for us. We declare it to the people in our lives. We start doing it. We walk the walk, right? We put it into action. And then when we get backlash or change back or hey, your life's weird now, we're happy, we're good. We, we do us. I can send you these slides. Oh, yeah. um, so those are the five key strategies to stress less that are a little deeper than yoga and meditation. <laughs> yeah. Figure out what's really going on. <laughs> fix the root cause. <laughs> Address your money mindset because money is a, such a big source of stress for people. What do you believe about money? What's true for you? What do I want to be true? Become magnetic, pay attention to the underlying energy in relationships, speak your truth, and create a life that you love. I wanna thank you guys for having me and Katie for inviting me. I have a gift for each of you. Normally I just do like 15 minute discovery calls with people like, hey, will, will, will what you do help me with this? Yes, it will, okay. Let's work together. But what I want to do for all of you um, is invite you to have an hour breakthrough call with me where we'll discover the three limiting beliefs that you have that are holding you back. We'll uncover those and then talk about what you can do to move forward, to remove them so that you can be happier. And, then, and so I have this sheet right here. If you would like me to send you a link for that call, just write your name and you don't have to write your phone number, just your email. 
ClaireUncafer.com. Uncafer. Claire Uncafer. <laughs> Sorry, honey. Wow. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. And I'm happy to answer any questions. But yeah, it's a crazy and wonderful light bulb moment when you start to question and challenge the stories you believed for so long when you didn't even know those beliefs were running the show and realize something different for yourself. So did anybody have any questions? Oh, gosh. <laughs> well, just to remind the guys, my Pam is, is doing her economic forecast for next Thursday. And um, just to give you a little idea of the future, we do have next month, um, Amy and uh, Amy Dahl and Gene Johnson went to Remax's luxury luxury conference. So we're starting a little luxury theme because, you know, the prices of homes going up, the threshold here is still 640000 So we've seen a lot more homes in that range. Mm -hmm. And we've had a lot of uh, people asking about luxury and what they need to know. So we're going to start off with Amy and Jean sharing what they learned. And then the following month in September, on the 12th, we're having a luxury panel. We have yours truly on this panel. And so, <laughs> along with Stephanie Clark and Suzanne House Rocher, we will have to move to Atlantic Bay's headquarters because I expect it to be a really full cool house. So we'll probably be sending you more information, but you get the early scoop since you're here today. Thanks for coming, as always. I look forward to seeing you guys next time. Yeah. Thanks for doing these. Yes, thank you, Claire. You're welcome. Jason, just get everyone to believe that they can do it. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.